Hare Krishna. My voice is pretty much finished, so <clears throat> I'll try to sing anyway. <clears throat> Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Ghor Bhakta Vinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Ghor Bhakta Vinda Dhyaya-dhyaya-succe-dhanya-dhyaya-nityananda <laughs> Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Hey Goranga 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 Ghoranga 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 Nityananda 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 Nithai Goranga, Nithai Goranga, Nithai Goranga, Nithai Goranga, Nithai Goranga, Nithai Goranga, Jai Satchinandhan, Jai Satchinandhan Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Nitai Gaur. Hey, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Temple or something? <laughs> Everybody's here. Okay. We like that. That's good. <laughs> Bring more. <laughs> so I was requested. <coughs> to speak on Lord Chaitanya's childhood pastimes. <clears throat> so there's a whole chapter dedicated to that, <clears throat> and that's chapter 14 of the Adi Leela. So I'll read some verses, and we'll speak, try to speak a little bit. I like to read the first verse because it's such an important verse. <clears throat> Do we... Have any kind of visual here? No. Nothing? Okay, everybody got their phones or whatever. So they'll, they'll read from the chapter 14. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya 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 Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakti Vrinda So this is <coughs> the Lord Chaitanya's childhood pastimes, verse number one. Okay, we're getting there. <coughs> So I'll chant real slowly, so maybe you can follow. Kantachana smriti yasmin. Kantachana smriti yasmin. 
Duskaram Sukaram Bhavet Vishmite Viparitam Syat Sri Chaitanyam Namamitam Okay, so word for word. Kanchkatanchana Somehow or other. Smrite By remembering. Yasmin. Whom. Duskaram. Difficult things. Sukaram. Easy. Bhavyat. Become. Vismrite. By forgetting him. Viparitam. Just the opposite. Shyat. Become. Sri Chaitanyam. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Namami. I offer my respectful obeisances. Tam. Unto him. So this, this verse is nice. <coughs> If you know this verse, then you'll be successful in Krishna consciousness automatically. Things that are difficult to do become easy to execute if somehow or other one simply remembers Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But if one does not remember him, even, even easy things become very difficult. To this, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I offer my respectful obeisances. Okay, so then we'll go on to the Lord's childhood pastime. So I'll read the verse again so you get it. Things that are very difficult to do become easy to execute if one somehow or other simply remembers Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But if one does not remember him, even easy things become very difficult. To this, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I offer my respectful obeisance. So here is the success of Krishna consciousness. It's Krishna Smarnam, Lord Chaitanya Smarnam, to remember the Lord always. So there is, um, I'll read, this is verse number 22. <clears throat> So we know Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took birth <clears throat> at the time when there was a lunar eclipse, yeah. which the lunar eclipse we know is to be uh, inauspicious. And so therefore, during lunar eclipses, we hear that people usually stay in the, inside. They don't cook or eat during that time. And usually, if they're very pious and religious, they worship their deities. It's considered to be inauspicious to be out or to be even doing certain material things during the lunar eclipse. But Lord Chaitanya uh, took birth during that time. <clears throat> so people were coming to the Ganges for bathing to purify themselves or to take holy snan during that time because to counteract the lunar eclipse. But the Lord arranged for him appearance at that time so people would chant the holy name of the Lord. So it says here, and this is one verse that describes that, verse number 22. So I'll just read. Kandirir Chala Balila Harinama Narasambahari Bala Hasta Gaudadama. The Lord caused all the ladies to chant the holy names of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra on the plea of his crying. So he's a little baby and he's in his little cradle there, crib. And while they chanted, the Lord would smile. So his Lord Chaitanya's mission for descending in this world is to get everyone to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Not only the devotees, but the whole world. <clears throat> So here he uses a little tactic. Sometimes we use tactics in order to get something better to manifest because of certain 
tactics. So in other words, tactics are sometimes little hidden or gupta or trickery. So in order to trick people to chant, he cried. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? So his crying was a way for them to think, oh, what are we going to do? We have to stop this baby from crying. And he's because this crying indicates distress. There's some distress there. So they wanted to relieve his distress. So whatever they did, they couldn't do. Well, no, he just keep crying. So, and then somebody would think, so I'll read the purport. In the Chaitanya Bhagavad, this pastime is described as follows. The Lord with his beautiful eyes would cry, but he would stop immediately on hearing the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. When the ladies, understanding the fun of the Lord, <clears throat> that discovered that he would cry and then stop upon hearing the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, <clears throat> they took it as a clue to chant Hare Krishna as soon as the Lord cried. Thus it became a regular function. The Lord would cry and the ladies would begin chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, clapping their hands. In this way, all the ladies in the neighborhood houses would assemble in the home of Sachimanta to join in the Sankirtan movement 24 hours a day. As long as the ladies continued to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, the Lord would not cry, but would very pleasingly smile upon them. Om again to Miranda Syagina Jana Salakaya Chaksamun Militam Yana Tasmay Sri Guru Vena Maha. So <clears throat> Lord Chaitanya's mission was to, is to uh, spread the Yuga Dharma. <laughs> Kali Kale Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar Nama Haiti Haya Sarva Jagat Nishtara. So there's no greater and no more important spiritual activity and no more effective spiritual activity than to glorify the Lord. And glorifying the Lord can come in different ways, but here's the essence of the glorification as given by the Lord himself. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So that was, that's one of the reasons why the Lord descended in this material world in order to propagate what is known as the Yuga Dharma or the means for self-realization in this age. So the principle of 16 rounds is just a means to get people to chant. <laughs> it's not like the conclusion. It's like on, when we give initiations, we say, do you agree to chant at least 16 rounds? Not just 16 rounds, but at least 16 rounds. It's not that we chant 16 rounds, we put the beads there and we say, see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, hang it on the nail. Yeah. It was nice knowing you for one day. See you tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to seeing to you tomorrow, but still I got to do it, so I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, you know, you have to go to court sometimes. So. <laughs> That was an obligation, but if we have if we have that attitude towards the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we will never understand this movement, <laughs> nor the purpose of the movement. And that the whole purpose of the movement is to glorify the Lord, because the essence of all activities, we see that in, even in the material world, people glorify each other for whatever accomplishments or whatever positions they may have in the world. In order to honor someone, to exalt someone, to express one's happiness towards that person. So that glorification is an innate quality of the living entity. It's just natural to glorify someone or somebody, positions. Um, in the material world, people glorify people who have position, power, money, some kind of abilities like that. But that glorification doesn't get you anywhere. It simply just makes you more and more, I guess you might say, tired. <laughs> but when we glorify the Lord, that awake, immediately awakens our spiritual nature. And when that glorification is done with enthusiasm, then it becomes the, the feature of unlimited happiness. 
So glorification of the Lord in its essence is done in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So therefore, glorification of the Lord is something that should be done throughout the day. We express ourselves in the form of the different services we do, and that is a form of glorification. But the essence of that glorification, which makes the chanting, which makes these services that we do really satisfying and what we say enthusiastic, is that we chant Hare Krishna. And we like to chant Hare Krishna. We look forward to chanting Hare Krishna. So in order for the Lord to satisfy his desire to purify the living entities, he uses different tricks. So here, he's getting people to chant simply by crying. So this is a very uh, effective way as a little child, of course, when he was older, he did the Sankirtan movement and performed kirtan in the house of Srivas with his disciples throughout the evening and throughout the day, Udila Aruna Gauda Navaji Dvijamani Gauda Amani Jagi. He was dancing and chanting with his, with his friends and his associates. He would get up early in the morning and then the first thing he would do he would leave his wife, Vishnu Priya, and then he would take his bath, and after bathing, he would go out and with his devotees and from the, in the villages, chant. And he would chant, they would chant loudly, so make sure everybody wakes up. <laughs> it, was like, it was like the alarm clock. <laughs> and then people would come out the door, oh, what's going on? Oh, there's, there's, there's Nimai Pandit. He's singing and dancing, it's so nice. So people would sometimes join, and others would close the door and go back to sleep. <laughs> you know, it's not everybody's the same, you know. But then, you know, so it's good to disturb the ignorant. <laughs> and so that's what he was doing, disturbing their so-called sense enjoyment. And so he would do that, and after he would go then, he would go down to the Banks of the Ganges, he'd take a bath in the Ganges, get new fresh attire, come back to his place, take some Maha Prashadam, and then he'd go out again, and he would go out and sing and dance throughout the whole day with his devotees. Practically, all, and in the evening, they would have really intense kirtan. So Mahaprabhu showed, <clears throat> by example, how to enjoy life. <laughs> sing and dance, right? Sometimes they say to us, you guys just sing and dance. Don't you do anything, you know, useful in life? <laughs> You're miserable and we're happy, so try it out, you know. <laughs> They're miserable doing the useful things. That's what they call it anyway. They say it's useful, but it's not. And But we're happy just singing and dancing. I mean, yesterday I... I saw the Sankirtan one party went out yesterday. That was so nice just to see the devotees chanting and dancing. So this purifies the atmosphere. It brings about, you know, pushes back the effects of Kali Yuga. And, um, and it inspires other people to eventually come to that point. Sometimes a person will hear our kirtan and all of a sudden they'll run towards the kirtan wondering, what is that sound? It's so attractive. That happened in London <clears throat> during the Rathiatra one time, where in, mm -hmm, um, Kripa Moya Prabhu was singing, leading the kirtan. And it was, an, it was a really quite, what we, we use the word ecstatic kirtan. <laughs> there, were thousands, there were hundreds and hundreds of devotees there. It was at least two or three kirtan parties for the Rathiatra. And uh, one lady, you know, middle-aged lady, she came running from the side, and she went right up to Kripa uh, uh, Moya and said, "What are you singing? What are you singing? I can't stop crying. I can't stop crying. It's so nice." <laughs> so her heart was completely, you know, penetrated by the sound of the holy name. That she didn't know what it was. She had never been exposed to it before. And here she was, so this is when people are in, their hearts are in a, what we say, a receptive mood. And when they hear the holy name, 
and it changes their whole consciousness. So this is our, this is our friend, so Lord Chaitanya did that. And he made that his focus. <coughs> We'll go on to one particular pastime. I'll read this particular pastime. <clears throat> One day, while the Lord was enjoying his playful sports with the other little children, Mother Sachi brought a dish filled with fused rice and sweetmeats and asked the child to sit down and eat them. But when she returned to her household duties, the child hid from his mother and began to eat dirt. All right, well. <clears throat> There is some dirt you can eat. It's called Ganges, Ganges mud. <laughs> That's pretty good. We even make sweets out of it. In Jamuna's cookbook, she takes to some recipes. You take Ganges mud and you mix it with various types of ingredients, and you turn it into a, a delectable sweet. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's very purifying. Seeing this, Mother Shachi hastily returned and exclaimed. What is this? What is this? She snatched the dirt from the hands of the Lord and inquired why he was eating it. <clears throat> Crying, the child inquired from his mother, Why are you angry? You have given me dirt to eat. What is my fault? He's a naughty child. <clears throat> and the Lord spoke. Fuse rice, sweet meats, and all other edibles are but transformations of dirt. This is dirt, that is dirt. Please consider, what is the difference between them? This body is a transform transformation of dirt, and the edibles are also a transformation of dirt. Please reflect upon this. You are blaming me without consideration. What can I say? So what is, what is Lord Chaitanya saying here? What is he doing? What, what is he presenting? Mayavadi philosophy, which is? It's all one. Yeah. In other words, anything material is simply a transformation of the different ingredients, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, for, well, the gross elements. And therefore, it's all the same. The different combinations make up the different varieties, but it's all the same combination of the five material elements, so it's all one, right? <laughs> What's wrong with that philosophy? It's correct, right? Partially correct. Where's the partial error? Where's the partial correctness then? And what is the partial error? All the ingredients come from Krishna, so in one sense they're one because they have one source, but they're not as identical to Krishna. Krishna is more than everything else put together. But Krishna is only one, so so whatever he produces is of the same nature, one. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but, you know, one in varieties. And what is the philosophy we, we adhere to? Yeah, thank you. Something is one, but it's actually different at the same time. <clears throat> but how, why, how can, can you explain what it means to be one and different at the same time? Give an example of that. Hmm? Who's talking? I can't hear, I can't The rays of the sun. Okay, so the rays of the sun and? The sun. So what is the explanation? That the sun rays are coming from the sun, and we say that the sun came to my eyes, but also the sun is not literally in our eyes. So what is the oneness? 
comes from the sun, but it's different from the sun. Yeah, you, you, Prabhupada said, just like you're sitting in your room and you say the sun is in my room, but if the sun was in your room, <laughs> you wouldn't be there, nor would your room be there. <laughs> but what is the word achintya? How does that apply to the principle of a beta beta tattva? It defies explanations. Although you can explain it, can you really under, can you really understand it through the explanation? It's like when we were one time in Kumbha Mela. <clears throat> so in the Kumbha Mela, Prabhupada was there, many of the devotees were there. So one devotee, he was uh, in a tent, and there was one Mayavadi also in the same tent with the devotee. So they were discussing. <clears throat> so the Mayavadi was presenting his philosophy. We usually call it philosophy, not exactly philosophy, but. And so the devotee, and it was cold. This was, you know, January in Kumbh Mela, it's really cold. So it was getting time to take rest. So the devotee said, all right, everything is one. So uh, here, give me your blanket. Because of whether you have it or I have it, it doesn't matter because it's all one. <laughs> and then he said, but what I'm going to use? He said, well, you know, I'll give you a part of the blanket because the blanket is, everything about the blanket is one, so it's all the same. So he took a thread from the blanket and he said, here, keep warm. <laughs> And so that you know that that shows the the fallacy of this philosophy that things are one in essence but different in variety different in variety if you know this philosophy then you can understand the nature of the absolute truth at least to a certain degree but the point is it is a chintya which means it defies logic and reason in the in essence <laughs> In other words, it's revealed through the process of pure devotional service. The Lord is teaching, speaking Mayavadi philosophy. And then, astonished, the child was speaking, Mayavadi, Mother Sasi replied, Who has taught you this philosophical speculation that justifies eating dirt? little purport, in the philosophical discourse between the mother and the son, when the son said that everything is one, as impersonalists say, the Maya mother replied, if everything is one, why do people in general not eat dirt, but eat the food grains produced from the dirt? Replying to the Mayavadi idea of the child philosopher, mother such, he said, my dear boy, <clears throat> if you eat Trans earth transformed into grain, our body is nourished and becomes strong. But if we eat dirt in the crude state, the body becomes diseased instead of nourished, and thus it becomes destroyed. <clears throat> in a water pot, which is a transformation of dirt, I can bring water very easily, but if I pour water on the lump of dirt, the lump would soak up the water and my labor would be useless. And then Prabhupada's purport goes into further explanations. So the Lord wants to teach. So even as a little child, he's teaching great philosophical important principles that we have to know. Because generally in the Western society, people uh, adhere to uh, Mayavadi or impersonal's philosophy. For them, to them, for people to understand that God is actually a person, immediately they apply the understanding that, well, <clears throat> person means like you and me. Jai Sisi Pancha Tattva Ki Jai. But spiritual personality and material personality are quite distinct in nature. So you can't say that. Although God is a person, he is a person like me. He has desires, he has likings, but he has form. 
And he has emotions, he has desires, everything is there within the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, when people think in terms of worshiping God as a person, they think that means I gotta do what he, do, do what he says, right? That's one of the objections. It's not an uh, overt objection, but they, they disagree with it in their heart because they don't want to follow. They want to think of God in the way they want to think of God or they want to do whatever they want to do and say that just like I was just, I was traveling the other day and I read this statement. We were in one travel lounge. I was in, where was I? I was in, I think, uh, I was in Calcutta, I was in travel lounge. And there was one statement. It said, drink beer because God wants you to become happy by drinking beer. <laughs> What's what it said, yeah. George Bernard Shaw, supposedly. <laughs> he said that. God wants you to be happy because Here's the way you become happy, drink beer. That way we can sell more beer, obviously. <laughs> so I was with one devotee from London, so when I said, you know, look, at, look that up. Is that a real statement? So he went through his, you know, Google. And he said, well, there's a statement there who says that there's eight statements that George Bernard Shaw did not say. And that was one of them. <laughs> so, you know, they'll do anything for sense gratification and justify it in the name of spiritual life, you know. So, yeah, this is... Now, Lord Chaitanya, we know, is Krishna himself. He's not different than Krishna. So when he appears as a little child, <clears throat> he acts in a very naughty way. And his naughtiness is actually very attractive. It, it attracts the hearts of those who, who are with him. Although they sometimes become a little disturbed by his naughtiness, externally that's their feeling, but internally they enjoy that naughtiness. So here is an example. Lord Chaitanya was very naughty. In fact, he made Krishna look like a good boy. <laughs> he was really naughty. <laughs> He, he said, oh, well, I want to show you what I came before. I can do it better this time. <laughs> so, he, so he said, uh, let me see, this is a series of... Sometimes the Lord would go with other children to bathe in the Ganga. And the neighboring girls would also come there to worship various demigods. Let's <clears throat> see, short purport. According to the Vedic system, when school, small girls, 10 or 12 years old, would go to the banks of the Ganges to take their bath, they would especially worship Lord Shiva with prayers to get good husbands in the future. They especially wanted to get a husband like Lord Shiva because Lord Shiva is very peaceful and at the same time most powerful. Formerly, therefore, small girls in the Hindu families would worship Lord Shiva especially in the month of Vaishaka, April, May. To take bath in the Ganges is a great pleasure for everyone, not only for adults, but also for children. So these young girls, knowing the Vedic tradition, that to get a good husband is the success of, the, of a woman's life. If she gets a good, qualified husband, then life is good. So here it says, when the girls engaged in worshiping the different demigods, so they were worshiping demigods, after bathing in a Ganga, the Lord would come there and sit down among them. Addressing the girls, the Lord would say, worship me, and I shall give you good husbands and good benedictions. The Ganges and Goddess Durga are my maidservants. What to speak of other demigods, even Lord Shiva is my servant. So these girls don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's, be, you know, my the Ganga is, you know, is is my, you know, is my uh, is the goddess Gurdurga. She's a goddess of the Ganga. 
She's, I don't know what she's also known as Sarah so Ganga Devi. She's my maid servant, and whatever you worship, even including Shiva, they're my servants. Without the permission of the girls, the Lord would take the sandalwood pulp and smear it on his own body, put the flower garlands on his neck, and snatch and eat all the offerings of sweetmeats, rice, and bananas. So they had all of these things ready for worship for the, for the devas to get you know, their benediction so they could get a nice husband. And so now he's ruining the whole thing. <laughs> he's sitting there. So all the girls became very angry at the Lord for, their, for his behavior. Dear Nimai, they told him, you are just like our brother in the village relationship. So a little sweetness there. Therefore, it does not behoove you to act like this. Don't take our paraphernalia for worship of the demigods. Don't create a disturbance in this way. And a reasonable petition, right? They're being logical. They're not crying or screaming at them or throwing their bananas. The Lord replied, my dear sisters, I give you the benediction that your husbands will be very handsome. They will be learned, clever, and young, and possess abundant wealth and rice. Because they say if you have grains, you have wealth. That's a, that's a sign of wealth. Not only that, but you will each have seven sons who will all live long lives and be very intelligent. Nice, pretty good. Yeah? All they had to do was worship him, and he's the worshipable person. But they don't know that. <clears throat> They're seeing him as just as one of the village boys. Hearing this benediction from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all the girls were inwardly very happy, but externally, as is natural for girls, they rebuked the Lord under the pretense of anger. Purport. The double dealing is the double dealings is natural for girls. When they're satisfied within, they externally show dissatisfaction. Such female dealings are very palatable to boys who try to make friendship with them. <laughs> so this is a little boy-girl uh, tactic here. <laughs> when some of the girls fled, the Lord called them in anger and advised them as follows. If you are miserly and do not give me the offerings, every one of you will have an old husband with at least four co-wives. And ugly, too. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> I'll read the purport. In India these days, in India in those days, and even until 50 years ago, polygamy was freely allowed. Any man, especially from higher caste, Brahmin, Kshatriyas, could marry more than one wife. In Mahabharata, or the old history of under, we see that Kshatriya kids used to marry many wives. According to the civilization, there was no restrictions against this. And even a man then, 50 years, could marry. But to be married to a man with many wives was not a very pleasing situation because the husband's love would be divided among the many wives. To punish the girls unwillingly to offer the naivadya, Lord Chaitanya may have apparently wanted to curse them to be married to men with at least four co-wives. The social structure allowing a man to marry more than one wife can be supported in this way. Generally, in every society, female population is greater in number than the male population. Why is that? Who knows? Why is the female population always, in every country, greater? Except in Greece. The man can impregnate more women. No, why is why is the female population in the world greater than the male population? Why are there more women in the world than men? It's, it's true, statistics even show that today. Hmm. 
Because of wars. <laughs> wars. Yeah, most of the you know, men get killed in the wars, and usually that causes a great reduction of population, the male population, generally. That's usually the case. Yeah. <clears throat> then there's another reason, which is not so easy to explain. Should I do it? No, I won't. Okay. Because in Kali Yuga, male potency has di diminished. And when the potency diminishes, there are more true female, females born than men. It says also, too, as a man gets older, it's very harder for him to produce a male son. Because the you know, potency goes down like that. I didn't make it up, I'm just repeating it, so don't, don't throw anything right now. <laughs> well, that, that, that's the fact, you know, because in due course of time, like that, because you want to get into the real, no, you don't want to get into that, that's, that's, you read the fourth canto of Bhagavatam, you can understand it, <laughs> I'll explain it more in detail says, if all of the girls are not married, there's a chance of adultery, and the society in which adultery is allowed cannot be peaceful or cannot be pure. In Krishna consciousness, we have restricted illicit sex. The practical difficulty is to find a husband for each and every girl. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the favor of polygamy provided, of course, that the husband is able to maintain more than one wife. When Prabhupada was traveling in New York, he met this one elderly lady, not so elderly, but she had a grown-up son. And Prabhupada also knew about the son, so he said to the lady, uh, your son is grown up, why don't you get him married? And the lady said, well, that's nice if he can support a wife. And Prabhupada was thinking, oh my God. The support of life is so difficult. <laughs> but that's true in Western countries because the, the lifestyle that we live requires so much arrangements and what we say financial security that it becomes very difficult just to maintain one family. But to speak of having many wives, which was the tradition in emergency cases like that. <clears throat> That's even happened in ISKCON, too. We've had some polygamy. I won't speak about that. <clears throat> anyway, so here, the girls then brought the offerings before the Lord. No, hearing the supposed curse by the Lord, the girls considered that he may know something uncommon or be empowered by demigods and were afraid that he may curse them and it would be effective. The, girl brought the girls brought the offerings to the Lord who ate them and blessed all the girls to their satisfaction. So you can see, the Lord is arranging different mischievous things just to get people to chant and to worship Him. He's tricking people to worship. So sometimes we do that also, right, in our preaching. And sometimes um, we say that if you chant Hare Krishna, you'll be free from distress, and you'll be happy, of course, that's true. Uh, we may also say, we might use different tactics in order to get people to take up Krishna consciousness, because sometimes a direct method is not very pleasing. So what is our biggest weapon to get people to chant Hare Krishna? Everybody knows about it, and it's the most effective. Who knows? Hmm? Hmm? Who said prashadam? Somebody just said? You got it. Prashadam. So Prabhupada said, make prashadam so nice that they have to come back. <laughs> they have to come back. Make it so tasty and once they think, oh my God, where you can't get food like this anywhere. 
And they sing too. Yeah, maybe it's a nice song. Let me try it. So that attracts people, prashadam. It's a really a very powerful form of bringing people to our movement. And then when they associate with devotees and we chant, then they're exposed to the holy name. So prashadam is very, very powerful. Okay, and uh, I'll just tell a little bit more of Lord Chaitanya's mischievous pastimes. I'll just speak. And Lord Chaitanya would go to the Ganges every day after he would go out to school. <clears throat> and he would take his bath in the Ganges. And sometimes the Brahmins would be there. And they would be standing in the water up to their waist. And they would take out their Gayatri thread. And they would be chanting Gayatri. So the Lord would sometimes swim underwater and he would pull their legs out and they would fall. <laughs> and, they would, <laughs> and, then, and then they would get angry. And sometimes uh, they'd be chanting Gayatri and he'd f swim next to them and he'd get up and he'd spit water in their face and then he'd swim away and start laughing. <laughs> Prabhupada said, where do you get this mischievous nature? It comes from God. <laughs> and then uh, what he would do is then when the men would take off their clothes for bathing and, you know, being gumptious, and then the ladies would go on, on the other side, and then the gats would be divided, he would take the ladies' clothes and put it on the men's side and take the men's clothes and put it on the ladies' side. So when the men came out, they were saris and cholis and all kinds of other things that we won't mention. <laughs> and the women would have these dhotis and things. <laughs> so, so he would do that. And then he, he would do all kinds of nonsense. And then the Brahmins, after a while, would get, would get disturbed, so they'd go to his house, <clears throat> and they would say, complain to his father, Jagannath Mishra, your son, every time we're trying to chant Gayatri or bathe, he comes, he spits water in our face, he does all kinds of things, he harasses us, he steals our clothes. You should punish him. You can't let him grow up like that, because if he grows up like that, you know, he's going to be not a very nice adult. He might, you know, be a criminal. <laughs> So well, they start speaking to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jagannath Mishra like that. So he would get angry, and he'd get a stick ready, and he'd be waiting for Nimai to come home. And then Nimai's friends would run to him and say, Hey, Nimai, your father's ready. He's going to punish you. <laughs> so what Nimai would do is that he'd go out and roll in the dirt, and then put ink all over himself. Because when he would come back from school, he'd always have ink on his hands and his clothes would be dusty. So, so one that day he came home and he's got ink on his hands and he's dusty. And his father's there with the stick and the father's ready to chat. And he said, well, Father, I didn't... And then his father would say, you know, these Brahmins are saying you're doing all these things. They're just trying to get me in trouble. They don't like me. <laughs> Actually, I just came from school, Father. Can't you see? I didn't even go to the Ganges. <laughs> His father would get bewildered. <laughs> he didn't know what to do. So that way you would trick like that. So you always had a way to get out. No one can punish the Lord. It's not possible. Of course, only Mother Yasoda could do that, but then she also got a reaction for that when she tied him up. And she, later on, it was explained how she suffered for doing that. <laughs> yeah, you can't punish the Lord, it's not allowed. <laughs> okay, so these are some of the Lord's uh, sweet pastimes. There's, a, is, there's an ocean of unlimited pastimes. As Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says, I'm standing on the shore of the ocean of devotion to Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, and I'm simply trying to taste one drop of that ocean. And that ocean is so sweet that it can drown anyone in love of God. So these are the 
it's the few of the unlimited pastimes of the Lord. As is explained, he was performing a pastime every second. Krishna Das, Kaviraj, and Vrindavan Das, Thakur, all of the authors of Lord Chaitanya's Leelas, all make the same statement. It's not possible to write down or even remember or even recall all of the pastimes Lord Chaitanya performed. Whatever they had was from the notes of Sarup Damodar Goswami and Raghunath Das Goswami. And, uh, and that was, and they were quite competent to keep, but no one could keep up with those pastimes. But these are some of the sweet pastimes. Would you like to hear more or should we stop here? Hmm? More? Okay, I'll tell you one little sweet pastime. This is really nice. Let's get rid of this thing. I can't see everybody. It's nice to see who you're talking to. Yeah, so... Lord Chaitanya was, was a little boy. He was playing with his friends down by the bank of the Ganges, and all of a sudden there was this little group of little tiny puppies. They were just born. So all the boys got together and they started going towards the puppies, and they started grabbing the puppies. And oh, such nice puppies. They started playing with the puppies, and Lord Chaitanya was also enjoying it with the puppies. And Lord Chaitanya said, I'm going to keep this one. And the boy said, no, no, you can't keep that one. That's the best one. I want that one. No, no, you, you, you always get the best one. Well, I want the best one this time. No, no, you can't have it. I'm keeping this one. So Lord Chaitanya, would, he wouldn't give up. So he kept this one little puppy. So, you know, in Vedic society, dogs are not allowed in homes, and people generally don't keep dogs as pets. Of course, I was just in India, and that's changing now. <laughs> yeah, and you can see it in India. People are actually walking their dog. Walking the dog or dogging the walk, you know. <laughs> walking the man, that's not walking the dog. The dog is walking you. Because <laughs> he's going where he wants to go and you're just following. <laughs> so, uh, so Lord Chaitanya brought the little puppy home. And he brought it into his house. His mother said, where'd you get that from? You can't bring it in. Dogs are going to happen. No, you have to keep him outside. So... She, she took the puppy and put it outside, and Lord Chaitanya was not happy with that. So uh, then he started playing with it outside, and then she was thinking, this is not good. He can't play with this dog all the time. So she said, you know, you go take your bath in the Ganges, and I'm going to take care of the dog, and when he comes back, you can play with him. So she was trick tricking him. So he left. And then he came back, and then one of his friends said, hey, your mother, she took the dog and she sent the dog away. So when he came back, the dog wasn't there. So he said to his mother, where's the dog? He was here a minute ago. I don't know what happened. Where, where's my puppy? I want my puppy. <laughs> and yeah, he was very insistent. And so she, she said, oh, cool. well, let's go look for him. She was just acting like, you know. So and he was very distressed. So now his puppy was gone. And so a little bit later, Lord Chaitanya is in, he's in, the, in the area of the town. And there's the same puppy. But the puppy is standing on its legs like this. And he's going like this, and he's like, he's dancing, <laughs> puppy dance. <laughs> Sometimes we dance like that too. <laughs> we dance all kinds of ways. Sometimes you, they say when we watch the women dance, they dance so nice, graceful, together, beautiful to watch. And the men, you take a potato and you roll it, and it goes this way and that way, so that's... Yeah, we... It's a little bit like uh, the men's style. I mean, I'm, I'm just one of the big potatoes also. <laughs> 
So, you know, so the dog was like doing his dog dance. And then from nowhere, a, a celestial plane descended from the spiritual world and came. And at one point, the dog, before the plane came, the dog was just dancing, dancing, and it fell over and died. As soon as it died, that plane came, and then the soul of that dog went into the plane and went back to the spiritual world. So it's good to be the puppy of Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> so simply by that little association with the Lord, and being that the Lord was affectionate to that soul who was in the form of a dog, that dog got special mercy and went back home back to God. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya actually delivered two dogs back to Godhead. And there's another pastime also. So that's sweet. So how, you, how Lord Chaitanya would do whatever he could. See, his mood is, I want to make as many living entities Krishna conscious as possible. That's a, that was his whole program. He told Lord, Chait Lord Nityananda, he, Lord Nityananda was an avid duda. He said, get married. Lord Nityananda didn't want to get married, but he said, you get married and well, you can preach to the Grihastas. Lord Chaitanya took sannyas so he could preach to the Mayavadis. And he made 60,000 Mayavadis uh, devotees. He could never reach the Mayavadis if he wasn't a, a sannyasi. But he did that just to save the conditioned souls. So Lord arranged his pastimes in such a way as to reach as many souls as he could with Krishna consciousness. That's his mercy. And of course, he traveled throughout the whole of South India, and he made practically the whole continent Krishna conscious. Wherever he went, he did the Harinam Sankirtan, and people followed him. And it says that he, he would make one person Krishna conscious by chanting with them, and then they would chant with someone else, and that person would become Krishna conscious, and that person would tell another person, and they would... So in this way, more and more people were becoming Krishna conscious, simply by Lord Chaitanya's traveling in South India. Any comments or questions? Anything? Yes, Rishab. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more, Maharaj, why is chanting Hare Krishna the, the biggest and the best way of glorifying the Lord? Try it out. <laughs> I'm trying it out. <laughs> uh, doesn't, doesn't get it. Kalair dosha nidi raja nasti ekum mahagun kirtana eva krishnas ya mukta sangam padam In this age of Kali, it's an ocean of faults. Kalo dosha nidi, nidi means ocean, dosha means faults. Kalair dosha nidi, in this age of Kali, so many faults. Asti echo, one boon. What is that? Kirtana eva krishnas, yeah. What is the result? Mukta sangam param bhajat. That you want go back, you can go back home, back to Godhead. You, in other words, you can purify your existence. It says just once, purely chanting one name of Krishna, one can immediately become free from all sinful reactions that one could possibly be committed for millions of lifetimes. How powerful Krishna's name is. And Krishna's name is Krishna. So it's Krishna in the form of sound. That's why it's the best, because it's non-different than Krishna. Abhinna tvam nami nami no. The name and he who is named is the same. Now that's nice. We say that and we believe it. Oh, can you understand it? <laughs> you can understand it by experience. Try doing something else continuously for hours on end. It's very, it's impossible. But when you can you chant, you can chant the holy names for hours on end and never get tired. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what we'll be doing, right? For the next couple of days. Yeah. So the scriptures emphasize the glory of the holy name as the supreme perfection of spiritual activity. So we take it from Shastra, but we can also understand it by experience. And why Maha Mantra uh, than other names? Hmm? And why is there a specific reason uh, why Maha Mantra and not some other names of God? Because Lord Chaitanya, Nam Nam Akari Bahuda Nija Sarvishaktis. All of the names of the Lord are powerful, the principal names. So they're absolute. But Lord Chaitanya emphasized the chanting of Hare Krishna. Therefore, he established the, the principle of worship. Just like it says in the scriptures, just so it says, it mentions the mantra, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari. That's written in Shastra, in many places. So there was one sadhu, he was making a point that this is how you chant. This is how you should chant. You chant the Hari Rama, then you follow with Hari Krishna. So, the point came to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, yes, the scriptures say that, but Lord Chaitanya did Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. So we follow the Supreme Lord who is acting in the role of the pure you know, spiritual master. We follow that. And there's a second reason, is that when you're chanting, you just keep going continuously. So what's first and what's second? Right. Okay. So, yes, uh, Bergendra? Uh, my question is if the Lord, both in his Rindavan pastimes and in his Naudvi pastimes, was uh, in certain circumstances, instances, uncontrolled, and acted uh, against Vaishnava etiquette, for example, uh, making fun of the brahmanas and <coughs> not and uh, making his father angry. Uh, then why do we have to be so controlled? <laughs> Go ahead and try that. And see what happens to you. <laughs> you think you'll get away with it? <laughs> You're not the Lord. <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, what is that verse? Tejo Samraja Sayar. What powerful persons can do, ordinary people can't do. They become defeated or even destroyed. Mm -hmm. Shiva drank an ocean of poison. Try it. <laughs> so, what... The great souls, or even the Lord can do, we shouldn't imitate. What the charyas tell us to follow, we follow. What the charyas tell us to restrict, we restrict. Otherwise, it'll be pre pretense and it'll be show. You know, there's a class of people who like to imitate the Lord to prove that they have some devotion, but. It's all imitation. And there was an example where <coughs> Srila Haridas Thakur, <coughs> he was dancing. Haridas likes to dance. So he was dancing in public. And there was a kirtan going on, so he was ecstatic, he was dancing. And one uh, Oh, okay. There was one, uh, uh, what does he call it? Snake charmer. 
he was playing his flute. And then Haridas was dancing to that, and it was Kirtan. So one man on the side, he was really looking insane, because Haridas was getting all the attention. So he was thinking, I'm going to do the same thing. So he ran into the middle and started to act like Haridas and start dancing like, you know, he was in ecstasy or something. It was just show, just to get attention. So the snake charmer came out with a stick and started beating the guy. <laughs> and he's running away. And people were thinking, why is he beating him? He didn't do that to Haridas. And then he explained, well, Haridas was real. He was chanting from his heart. He was feeling the happiness. This person was just making a show. He was envious of Haridas, like that. So if we try to imitate the Lord, we're trying to be, well, it's just a sign of becoming, trying to get some attention, which is another sh form of envy. So we have to follow the etiquette. So it's Vaishnava etiquette. <laughs> so that becomes clear, so we should know that. And that way, if you follow the etiquette and you become Krishna conscious at the same time, then you become effulgent. If you practice Krishna consciousness and you don't follow the etiquette so strictly, you're still glorious, but at the same time, when the etiquette's there, it takes it to another level. Etiquette is very important. Lord Sanatana Goswami glorified Haridas Thakur for his etiquette. And Lord Chaitanya said, he said, the etiquette of a Vaishnava is the ornament of the Vaishnava. It's like if you dress up nicely, just like if you wear a far flower garden, that's like an ornament. So that becomes noticeable because it's orna an ornamentation. So women, they also wear nice necklaces or something, maybe some flowers to make some ornamentation. That's noticeable. So Vaishnava etiquette is like that, it becomes noticeable. It becomes the ornament of the devotee. Not to imitate the Lord or even the pure devotees. Yes, uh, Mohani Nasanirata. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj, for the nice lecture. Uh, for me, it appears, it appears uh, the question, why uh, do we uh, sometimes lose uh, the inspiration to chant uh, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra? Uh, if it's uh, caused by uh, uncontrolled senses, uh, that we get uh, sometimes angry to someone, cause some... Um, yeah, Vaishnava Parada or... Uh, yeah, both, all of these things are true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what could we do against it to not to lose uh, the inspiration and uh, not to have this much ups and downs or just uh, continuously just go up and become a better person and have better qualities? Well, Prabhupada made the point, chance Six, chant 16 rounds and avoid the offenses. So he made that as a statement during initiation. So he didn't say just chant 16 rounds, he said avoid the offenses, the 10 offenses. Because if we're committing the offenses, then we get very little taste or practically anything from the chanting. So recite the 10 offenses, we do that every day in the morning program, learn them, and learn how they apply, what they mean. And practice the 11th offense to chant attentively. So if we're still chanting inattentively, then we'll commit some of the other offenses. Bhaktivinoda Thakur makes that point. He said, inattentive chanting 
leads to the tendency to commit offenses. <laughs> hmm. So work on attentive chanting. And if you feel like you've offended anybody, apologize. If you're not sure who you offended, then do a general apology to the Lord and to the pure devotee. Okay, so maybe we can stop here. Thank you very much. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki, Srila Prabhupada ki jai.